Ephesians chapter chapter 6. I want to continue to share on the subject of praying and how that I just finished six hours on the subject of prayer and we called that Lord teach us to pray. Those first six hours that was my introduction. Amen. Amen. And so we're out of the introduction now and I want to I want to segue now into some of the things I brought up and specifically how to pray. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, that was our main text, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. If John taught his disciples to pray and Jesus taught his disciples to pray, then we, the disciples of the Lord, need to learn to pray. We need to learn how to pray. I remember again coming up in church and I would ask a question and people would say, well, brother, just pray about it. Okay, and then I'd have a problem and people would say, brother, just pray about it. Well, that's not bad advice, but I needed more advice like how do I pray about this problem? How do I pray about this situation? This morning I want to begin to teach on different kinds of prayer. Different kinds of prayer because there are different kinds of prayer for different kinds of situations that we face. And I was not taught those things. I was taught and not literally taught but just told again to pray but not taught how do I do I pray? How do we learn to pray? How did I learn to pray? It is amazing the things I've learned about prayer and yet I'm still growing and I'm still learning to pray and and how to pray in my own prayer life. One of the things I do not want to do even though I'm being extensive is complicate this. I don't want to make it complicated but there are some things you have to learn and you have to know to be successful in your in your prayer life. And so how did I learn? How do we learn to pray? Well, first of all, we have the scriptures and we have prayers in the Old Testament and prayers in the New Testament and we can crash those prayer meetings. Have you ever thought about, I wish I could crash a prayer meeting where there's someone who really knows how to pray and just listen in? Well, the Bible has prayers in it in the Old Testament Prayers in the New Testament that you can crash those prayer meetings and you can learn how they prayed and thereby how to pray. You can you can look at how Elijah prayed and learn some things, how Elisha prayed. One of my favorite prayers is Jehoshaphat in the book of Chronicles. And when these armies came against him and it was overwhelming, man, did that guy pray. And you can read that prayer and learn some principles of prayer. Learn how to approach God and how to trust God by even Jehoshaphat. You can read the Psalms and and David's prayers. And you can learn some things about prayer by listening to David pray. By listening to David pray. When it comes to the Old Testament, we have to be a little careful because of law versus New Testament grace. And there are some things prayed under the Old Testament that do not apply to the New Testament. Like prayers of intercession. They interceded differently in the Old Testament than we intercede under the New Testament. Under the Old Testament, Moses prayed many times and interceded for Israel and, and turned the wrath of God in intercession from the people of God. We don't have to pray a prayer like that under the New Testament. Jesus is our Moses and he's turned the wrath of God from us and he ever liveth now to make intercession for us. For us. So I don't have to pray that way. And so I need to be careful again the prayers under the Old Testament versus New Testament, but I can still learn some principles of prayer and things of that nature. The book of Acts is wonderful, and and the apostles and how they prayed, and some of the recorded prayers in the New Testament, you can crash that prayer meeting, and you can learn how they prayed and and grow in your in your prayer life. Of course, Paul taught us in many passages. We'll be looking at some specific ways that Paul taught us to pray that are very effective in our, in our prayer life for ourselves and even in intercession for, for other people. One of the things I desire as we, as we transition, and I believe we're in a transition right now, even in our church, to another level and another place, is that we raise up more people that really know how to pray, listen, to be a model for the younger people to teach them how to pray. One of the main ways you learn to pray is getting around somebody that knows how. And just listen. Just agree with them. Just say yes and amen. Yes and amen. And listen to how they pray and learn through through models and people who know how to pray. 
actually that's what messed me up is, is hanging out with people that prayed but didn't know how to pray. I'm not putting Pentecostals down. Again, I are one. But raised in a Pentecostal church, there were some of the craziest prayers prayed that I thought were supposed to pray that way. I didn't know begging and prayer were not synonymous. I thought if you begged sincerely enough, you could get God to move on your behalf. Oh, I really thought, here's how you pray, by watching other people pray. You cry. You bawl and wail and cry. And the harder you cry and the longer you cry, you'll pull God's heartstring and he'll do something for you. God's not moved by our prayers in the sense of crying and bawling and squalling. We need to pray in faith. It is faith that pleases God. It is faith that removes mountains. It is praying in faith that makes a difference, not wailing and bawling and crying. And and the harder you wail, bawl, and cry, the more you're going to see the power of God. It is faith that releases the power of God. It is faith that pleases God. So we need to learn to pray in faith and by And by faith. So let's look at this now in these different kinds of prayers. And I believe this is going to help every single one of us. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul is teaching their armor of God. And once you've put on the whole armor of God, once you're clothed for battle, then he starts talking about praying. The way we do most of our warfare, saints, is by praying. And praying the way God taught us to pray. The way things are changed is by praying, not picketing. I said a lot. Thank you, Jesus. We need to learn to pray and spend time in prayer and praying effectively. So we've got this armor, and all of a sudden in verse 18, he says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and for supplication for all saints. Verse 19, And for me... Paul, Paul says, pray for me. Now, if the Apostle Paul need prayed for, I need prayed for. If the Apostle Paul need prayed for, then Pastor Lee needs prayed for. If the Apostle Paul needed prayed for, then our children's church workers and our youth ministers all need prayed for. But notice he didn't just say, pray for me. He told them how to pray for him. Look at this real careful, verse 19. And for me... That utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mysteries of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in in bonds, and therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. He didn't just say pray for me, he told them what to pray. I learned over the years to never ask anybody to just pray for me. I never say pray for me. When I ask someone to pray for me, I tell them what to pray for me and how to pray for me because I don't want people speaking curses over my life and nonsense and foolishness like God humble him (laughs) or God send this into his life to keep him humble or on and on it goes with word curses and things that are said in the name of prayer that I don't want prayed over me and my family. So when I ask you to pray for me, I ask you what to pray for me and how to pray for me. He said, pray that I would, I would be given utterance. Pray that I would be and speak as the oracle of God. Pray that I would bring something to the people besides what the six o'clock news is bringing. Pray that I would, I would have utterance and be the oracle of God and speak in, in terms of my words being spirit and life. Pray that I would have utterance, divine utterance. And number two, he says, pray that I would speak boldly, boldly. It takes a lot of boldness to share the truth in this culture. It takes a supernatural boldness to share the things of God with all the opposition that's out there, with all the religion that's out there, with all the philosophy that's out there. So he said, pray for me that I would speak boldly. And then number three, he said, pray that I would make known the mysteries of the gospel. Pray that I would reveal divine secrets. Pray that I would unveil and unfold the kingdom of God and principles in the kingdom of God and how to seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness that all things might be added unto us. Boy, I want people praying like that for me too. I want the intercessors of this church praying for the leaders in that way, the way Paul asked to be prayed for. Notice again in verse 18, we're to be praying always with all prayer. God's word Translation says of Ephesians 6, 18, Praying in the Spirit, use every kind of prayer and request there is. Pray in the Spirit, 
And when you pray in the Spirit, use every kind of prayer and request there is. See, there's different kinds of prayers that we are to pray for different kinds or situations in our lives. The NIV translation says, of verse 18, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers. Everybody say, all kinds of prayers. And request, with this in mind, be alert, always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. See, there's different kinds of of prayers, and there are different principles that govern these different kinds of prayers. See, a lot of people think all prayers just prayer. And I remember someone saying that to me, all prayers just prayer, right? Well, there are prayers, and, and, and prayer is prayer, but within the subject of prayer, this big umbrella called prayer, there's different kinds of prayers, with different kinds of rules, with different kinds of principles that govern those different kinds of prayers that apply to different situations. Sue may ask me to pray with her about something, and that particular situation calls for this kind of prayer that's governed by these kind of rules. Don may ask me to pray for him about something, but it's a totally different situation, and there's another kind of prayer that needs to be prayed for that situation with different kinds of rules. It's a lot like sports. While there are many things that make up the umbrella of sports and come under the covering of sports, not all sports is sports. Within the subject of sports, there's basketball, there's football, there's baseball, and other sports. And... Each one of those sports have different rules that govern that sport. And if you're going to if you're going to play baseball, you have to learn baseball rules because if you play baseball with basketball rules, you're not going to win. Amen. Now you can play baseball with football rules, but you're not going to win. I don't want to just play to play. I want to win. That's like people say all the time. Well, it's not if you win or lose. It's how you play the game. Fooey, play the game right and you'll win. (laughs) Amen? Play the game better than anybody else plays it. And according to the rules, then you'll win. Well, prayer is just prayer. And it doesn't matter how you pray or what you pray. Just pray. No, no. If you're going to pray and see fruit, if you're going to pray and see success, you're going to have to pray the way God taught us to pray. Prayer isn't a subject that we approach God on our own terms or our own ideas or philosophy and we just say what we want to say and call it prayer. God has taught us certain rules of prayer. He's he's taught us how to pray about that kind of situation. And I was not taught these things. And I'm telling you, it makes a major mega difference. Let me give you some quick examples of different kinds of prayers And there are different principles that govern these different kinds of prayer. There's the prayer of faith. That right there changed my life as much as anything I was ever taught, is how to pray the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith is what you pray for yourself. And what you pray to receive your needs met. To receive the promises of God. To receive the blessings of God. There's a specific prayer and kind of prayer that we're to pray. And it's called the prayer of faith. Then there's the prayer of agreement. The prayer of agreement is a different kind of prayer than the prayer of faith. And while you pray the prayer of agreement in faith, the prayer of agreement is not the prayer of faith. Does that make sense at all? Not yet? There's the prayer of petition and consecration to God. That's a different totally kind of prayer. Jesus prayed a prayer of dedication and consecration to the will of God in the garden. And he had to pray it three times. And he had to keep praying that and keep praying that. And he said that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Be honest. Aren't there some things that you've known in your life that is the will of God for your life and you really wanted it and you desired it, but your flesh was weak? You didn't know how to pray the prayer of dedication. You didn't know how to pray the prayer of consecration to the will of God so that your spirit could take ascendancy over your flesh and you do what God has called you to do. Amen. Amen. Many people fall and fail, not because they want to fall and fail. They want to do what's right. They want to obey God and fulfill God's will, but their flesh is weak. And Jesus in the garden in Matthew 26, he, he prayed three times and consecrated himself to the will of God. He knew what the will of God was. And he, he prayed if there's any other way 
to save mankind, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That's a prayer of dedication, of consecration. I would have quit the ministry years ago if I didn't know how to pray that. If I didn't know how to, through some hard times and issues, dedicate myself to the will of God, consecrate myself to the will of God. That's a type of prayer. It's a kind of prayer, and we'll look at that. There's the prayer of intercession, where you're praying for other people, and you're standing on behalf of other people. And, and your children and people you work with, you're praying prayers of intercession. And you need to learn how to do that according to the Word of God. There's praying in the Spirit. That's a different kind of prayer. And there are things that govern that kind of prayer, praying in the Spirit. There's fasting and praying. I probably won't teach that on Sunday because some of you would faint just hearing about fasting. And so we'll probably go to Wednesday night on sharing on fasting and prayer because I want to dig into this because there's a lot of things said about fasting and praying that are not accurate. It's different under the New Testament than the Old Testament when it comes to fasting and prayer. And you need the two together, fasting and prayer. And I had heard some things soon. I had just gotten married and I had heard some things about fasting and they didn't tell the whole truth. They just talked about the power that comes with fasting and praying and the joy of coming uh, that comes with fasting and prayer. And so Sue and I dedicated ourselves and we decided we're going to fast and pray and we were miserable. I'm talking about after the first meal. Grumpy and touchy and this doesn't feel good, this isn't fun. And then we really messed up. We watched TV that night. Every commercial was a food commercial. And I'll never forget the Brahms commercial and the malts and the shakes. And oh my God, I'm foaming at the mouth. We broke that fast and ate like pigs. <laughs> Just a couple of pigs. People telling me this is productive and fun. Did you know sometimes prayer is work? It's not always easy to pray. It's not always fun. It's not always easy on the flesh. It takes discipline many times to endure and to pray through some things in your life. In your life. And so I promise you these things are going to be helpful to you as we progress, as we progress through them. All right, let's look at some scriptures here on these different kinds of prayer. Because I went to church my whole life again and I'm not being critical. I'm trying to help people. I never was taught how to pray, and that there were different kinds of prayers for different situations in my life. And this has been so beneficial to me. The first one we'll look at quickly, we'll just put it on the screen. James chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. James 5, 14 and 15. Is there any sick among you? Is there any sick among you? Within the church, is there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church. Let them pray for them. In the name of the Lord, anointing them with oil, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise them up, and if they've committed any sins, they'll be forgiven. That's a specific prayer that we're supposed to pray, and it's called the prayer of faith. Notice it's not the prayer of begging. It's not the prayer of wailing and bawling and crying and, 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 and just... And just screaming at God or on and on we could go with things that people do instead of what it says do. It's the prayer of faith. That's a specific prayer. That prayer is embodied in Mark eleven twenty four. We'll look at this later in detail. But Jesus said, whatsoever things therefore you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. How can, how can we, many of us, even go through the faith movement and not understand that the prayer of faith can only be prayed for you, for you to receive God's provisions, for you to receive God's, God's uh, blessings in your life. You can't pray the prayer of faith for somebody else. It's for you. And we have tried to use the prayer of faith for other people, and they have to believe for themselves. Now, when it comes to our children, when they're little, they're so under our covering. I could pray the prayer of faith for my children when they were innocent under my covering. But even as my children begin to grow, I couldn't pray the prayer of faith for them. They had to pray the prayer of faith for themselves. They had to believe for themselves. You can't use your faith to override other people's will. Listen, and you can't use your faith to override other people's unbelief. Many times when Jesus held meetings, it says the power of God was there to heal them all. And only one person got healed. 
Not because God didn't will to heal them all, but because one believed. And Jesus couldn't use his own faith to override people's will. Jesus left people sick all the time. He left a whole porch full of people sick, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit operated in him. And he healed one man on that day by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He didn't just, like lightning coming from his hands, heal everybody against their will and overpower them. I remember I taught on healing one time. And a man came up to me and said, If you really believe God willed to heal everybody, why don't you just go empty all the hospitals? That's dumb. Now, he was precious to the Lord. (laughs) But that's dumb. I can't just go empty the hospitals because I believe God wills to heal because I've been healed and I've received my healing. They have to believe. In Mark chapter 6, the Son of God, the Bible says, in his own hometown could do no mighty work and he marveled because of their unbelief. Even Jesus in his own hometown could do no mighty work because of people's unbelief. You can't use your faith and override other people's unbelief. You can still pray for them. You can still help them. You can pray God deliver them from ignorance. You can pray that they hear the word of God. And that faith will come by hearing and hearing the word of God. You can intercede for them. And I'll get into that as I progress. Everybody okay so far? A lot of people have not known this. They've learned the prayer of faith... And the prayer of faith is for you to believe, for you and, and your needs to be met in your life. It's one of the most important prayers that you learn to pray. And I wasn't taught it. And once I learned that, I began to see miracles in my life. I began to receive for me what God had promised me. I began to see the promises of God come to pass through the prayer of faith. Write down Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 and 19. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 and 19. It's the prayer of agreement. Verily I say unto you, Jesus speaking, Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you, everybody say two, Two. if two of you shall agree on earth is touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. I can pray the prayer of faith for me, I can pray the prayer of agreement for thee. But we have to agree. And we have to touch that thing in agreement. And a lot of people think they're agreeing in prayer, but I can't tell how many people I've prayed for over the years, they didn't agree with me. And it hindered the power of God in that prayer. We have to agree. <laughs> I, remember, I remember years ago, I spent a whole hour on the prayer of agreement. And a lady come running down to the altar and said, I believe that, Pastor Dwayne. Would you agree with me in prayer? And I said, yes, ma'am, I will. What would you like me to pray? And she said, it's an unspoken request. I'm blessed to have hair on my head. You just want to pull it out. Your eye starts twitching like... I just spent a whole hour teaching you the prayer of agreement. You want me to pray the prayer of agreement, but you won't tell me what we're agreeing on. How can we agree if I don't know what you're praying for? We're just being religious. I'll still pray for you, but I can't pray the prayer of agreement till you tell me what we're agreeing for. How do I know she's not believing for her husband to die? Don't laugh too hard. These are true stories. How do I know she's not asking me to agree with her for something that's immoral? I can't agree with you for something unmoral, immoral. How do I know she's not asking me to agree with something that violates the scriptures? So if we're going to pray the prayer of agreement, and when I teach this, first of all, don't you come up and ask for an unspoken request. (laughs) Number two, when I pray on the prayer of agreement, I'm going to teach you what it really means to agree. What the word agree means. Because you're going to discover that a lot of people ask you to pray for them and with them, but they really don't agree with you. And we have to agree agree together as touching that that thing. Two, becoming one in a covenant contract with God. And I'm telling you, when we really agree, one will put a thousand to flight, two will put ten thousand to flight. Deuteronomy 32, 30. There's power in agreement. But you got to agree. You got to agree. Number three, third kind of prayer is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. It's prayers of intercession. Prayers of intercession. Interceding is praying on the behalf of somebody else. It's praying for others many times when they don't even know you're praying for them. The prayer of intercession. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, two different words. 
Supplications, prayers. Supplications means petitions, request. That's what most of us that have grown up in church, when I say prayer, most of us think of asking God for something. But there's more to prayer than just asking God for something. Many times prayer involves asking God for someone else on behalf of another. Standing with somebody else. In intercession, let me finish this. He said, I exhort that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Notice that we are to offer supplications for other people. We're to offer prayers, which is just in that context, in that word, it means communication with God, period. Just communicating with God. Then he says intercessions. That's a specific kind of prayer when you intercede, when you stand in the gap, when you stand on behalf of someone else. How do you do that? And I want to share at least an hour, maybe two on that specific kind of prayer. But notice he said whether it's a supplication a prayer, or intercessions, do it with thanksgiving. Listen to me carefully, and I'm going to reinforce this at the end of the service today. No matter what kind of prayer we pray, no matter who or how, who we pray for or how we pray, every prayer needs to be laced with an attitude of thanksgiving. Whether it's the prayer of faith, you need to be praying and offering thanksgiving. Whether it's the prayer of agreement, you need to be offering thanksgiving. Whether it's intercession, you need to be offering thanksgiving. Whether it's just talking to God. Some, some prayer is just being honest with God. And it's just talking to God. And even in that, you need to say thanks. Thank you that you hear me. Thank you that you care. Thank you that I can be honest with you. Do you know, I still struggle to this day... 30 years of ministry, and I, 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 I'm not saying that quite right. I don't struggle, but I'm not as comfortable with public prayer as I am with my personal prayer life with the Lord. To me, most of my prayers outside of these different kinds of prayers is just me talking to the Lord. Just fellowshipping with the Lord. Just being honest about things. Amen. That this bothers me, Lord. And this concerns me. And this, this troubles me. And... and To me, prayer is intimacy, and intimacy is private. Intimacy is confidential. Do you know when you're intimate with someone, the very definition means there's confidentiality involved. Well, there's some things I say to the Lord I would never, ever say to anybody. Amen or oh me. And I ain't going to do it now, so don't look at me like that. I'm nervous on this series sometimes because I do kind of whatever comes to me, I'm going to go ahead and share that. And some of it's personal. And I don't want to admit it, but it helps people. And if I can get my courage up, I will admit it. Like there was a move years ago of, of praying at 5 o'clock in the morning for an hour. I'm not against that. A lot of good came out of that. Good teaching on praying for an hour at 5 o'clock in the morning. But man, people thought they were spiritual because they got up at 5 and prayed for an hour. And if I didn't get up at 5 o'clock and pray for a whole hour, I'm not spiritual like they're spiritual. Fooey. God ain't up at 5 o'clock. I hate to break this to you. There's a reason why the sun comes up around 6.30, 7 o'clock. And if I didn't get my hour in, I'm messing up or I'm feeling condemned. It'd be better for you to pray for five minutes and mean it with your heart and be sincere with God than to pray for five minutes out of a pure heart and then put in 45 or 55 minutes to get your hour in. And I remember I was trying to get my hour in. And I had like 15 minutes to go. And I didn't have anything else to say. And so I just said, Lord, I, I don't want to be here. I'm, I'm bored with I don't want to be here. And I couldn't believe his answer. He said, neither do I. <laughs> God doesn't want to be with us if we don't want to be with him. God isn't having fun with this either if we're not having fun with it. And the point was being honest with God. And that's a part of a good prayer life is being honest. Even after I teach you all of these, all of these principles, all these different kinds of prayers and, and, and the rules of prayer that govern these prayers, you can't, you can't just become mechanical about this and not have your heart in it. 
and not have your heart in it. God wants your heart in it. When your heart's in it, his heart gets in it. And I'm telling you, hearts are changed supernaturally when we really pray from the heart. From the heart. So we've got these prayers of intercession. Go to the book of Jude. Let's look at this one. The book of Jude. That's that little bitty book just before Revelation. It's one chapter. And by the way, it's the book of Revelation. I just want to hear one preacher one time say the book of Revelation. It's not the book of revelations. That's why there's so much confusion with the book. We got all these revelations coming out of there. It's the book of revelation. The revelation of the risen Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and his overcoming church whipping the snot out of the devil. That's the book of revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus and his his people united to him in the earth overcoming all principalities and powers. Well, that's not the topic. But there's a little bitty book just before the book of... Everybody say it. I want to hear you say it. The book of... Very good. Don't you put an S on the end of that. It's the book of Revelation. And so Jude, Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. He's the brother of James. And this book is, is just packed. And he starts the book off with... He's going to talk about his brother, Jesus. He's going to talk about what his brother did in bringing salvation to the world. And all of a sudden it quickly turns. And he starts dealing with false prophets. With false teachers. With all these doctrines that were being propagated even in the first century church. Let me tell you, there's false prophets today. There's false teachers today that are teaching and saying a lot of stuff that's not in the Bible. And, and so he's dealing with it. And to be honest, I don't know what kind of personality Jesus' brother had. But this guy is pretty hard. And I mean, he's nailing these people with no apology. So he's saying all these hard things. And it starts to shift in verse 19. These be they. Talking about all these false prophets and teachers. These be they who separate themselves. Sensual, having not the Spirit. They were sensual, having not the Spirit. Now listen to me. The word sensual in Scripture does not just mean and identify with our sexuality and with lust and concupiscence and things like that. The word sensual means dominated by your five physical senses. Dominated by your five physical senses. Now, be honest. How many Christians do you know the only truth they operate in or believe is real is what they can see, smell, hear, taste, or touch? Their feelings are their God. If this is how they feel about it, it must be real and it must be the truth. They have not the Spirit. You, you, you can't be dominated by just your five physical senses. There is truth that supersedes your five physical senses. Like there's, an, there's a, a spiritual realm. You can't contact that realm with your five physical senses. There's angels in this room right now. But you can't, you can't feel them. You can't, you can't see them. You can't hear them with your five physical senses. But they're here. Amen. And yet most Christians are dominated by what they see. By what they feel. By what they hear. He said, these people are sensual. They don't even have the spirit. Verse 20 says, but you, beloved. Now he's shifting gears. He's talking about us. But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Wow. Wow. He said, when you pray in the spirit. We need to know what that means. Because if you pray in the Spirit, you build yourself up on your most holy faith and you keep yourself in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, I I just can't think of a more powerful promise in the Bible than that. Build yourself up on your most holy faith. Be honest. How How many of you have at least thought before, if I'd have just had a little more faith, I wouldn't have done that. If I'd have just had a little more faith, I would have gone there. If I'd have just, if I'd have just had more faith, I would have been able. I guarantee you, if you're honest, there's been times in your life that you thought, if I just had a little more faith. Did you know praying in the Holy Ghost, praying in the Spirit, you build yourself up on your most holy faith and keep yourself in the love of God. How many things have we done 
that we didn't keep ourselves in the love of God. Had we been praying in the Spirit and knowing what it meant to pray in the Spirit, we could have kept ourselves in the, in the love of God and we could have built ourselves up on our most holy faith. I can't wait to get to that. Amen? I want to know what that means. And how do I do that? Because I want to build myself up on my most holy faith and I want to keep myself in the love of God and I want to be looking for the mercy of God versus the judgment of God. Versus the judgment of God. All right, go to Philippians chapter 4. And I'm going to share the most important thing concerning prayer that we're going to have to stick with and understand no matter what kinds of prayers we learn to pray. And what I'm about to share now has, has kept me as much as anything that I can teach. That I can teach. So we got these different kinds of prayer. We got the prayer of faith, prayer of agreement, prayer of intercessions, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now look at what Paul said about praying. And there's three things I want to leave with you today that I, I, I beseech you by the mercy of God that you listen, that you pay attention to this last point that's going to help us through the next few months, no matter what I teach. In, in Philippians chapter 4, look at verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. Underline this. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, everybody say finally. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, pure, lovely, of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Think on these things. Three things there. Quit worrying. Be careful for nothing. Be careful for nothing doesn't mean walk across the street and not look both ways. Amen? Be careful there, for nothing means don't worry about stuff. Don't fret about stuff. But with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Pray, but make sure you have the right attitude in pray and be thankful. Make sure any prayer you pray, any kind of prayer, any type of prayer, that you offer that prayer with thanksgiving. And then number three, get your mind right. Think on this stuff. Now, I can truthfully say that those three things and applying those to my everyday life have, have, have transformed everything about my life. I can't tell how many preachers self-destruct because of worry, because of stress, because of anxiety. Saints, the human heart doesn't have the capacity to carry the burden of one's own life, much less thousands of other people's lives. You can't do it. You can't do it. Worrying is killing you. It is a pill that kills. It, it will not add one stature to your life. It won't improve your life. It won't change anything. Worrying and fretting and being anxious and fearful and, and not able to sleep is not fixing anything. It's killing you. Do you know how many people? God rest my mother's soul. She really believed that love was directly connected to worrying about people and, and staying up all night, wringing your hands. If you really love people, you'll worry and you'll fret. And it killed her. My mother died a young age, and part of it was worry, anxiety, care, fears. It killed her. Worrying will make you old and ugly early. Some of you, I don't want to lie to you, you're going to get old and ugly no matter what, okay? I need to tell you the truth in love. Some of you, it's happening right in front of me. But if you want to excel that process, if you want to get old fast, and if you want to get ugly, and when I say ugly, I'm talking about a lot of stuff. Ugly makes up a lot of stuff. I'm talking about your attitude. I'm talking about your outlook in, on life. I mean just ugly. Keep worrying. Keep fretting. It's not fixing anything. It's killing you. And so all of us have to learn to cast our care upon the Lord. For he cares for us. I remember my mom 
getting upset at me one time, and she just jumped all over me and said, Don't you even care? <laughs> and I wasn't being a smart aleck. I know I can be. I'm honest about that. I'm getting better. Ain't I? <laughs> I wasn't being a smart aleck, but I looked right at her and said, No, I don't care. I've cast my care upon the Lord. I'm not going to worry about this. I can't worry about all the things that happen in our church and in your lives. I need to, listen, I need to be careful for nothing. But now, by prayer and supplication, make my request known to God with thanksgiving. I can be thankful that God cares. I can be thankful that God has broader shoulders than I have. I can be thankful that he's made a, a way of escape. I can be thankful that a provision's been made for our church, for your families, for whatever you're going through. I can pray for you and I can cast that care upon the Lord and I can be thankful that God will never leave or forsake you and that God, he is God, not me. God, he is God, not you. And the third thing is the most difficult for people. I can convince them to quit worrying and give it to God. I can convince them to pray. And they think if they'll just cast their care on the Lord and pray, the peace of God will keep them in their hearts and minds. They never get to the finally. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are just and pure and lovely and of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, when do I know now, here's what's going to change you. I actually shared this last night, and it helped me understand something about myself to where I can help you. I do this, but I wasn't conscious that I do it. When do I know to ask for help in prayer? When do I know to go to somebody and say, would you pray with me? Would you pray for me? There's situations in my life, there's things that happen to me that I need help. How do I know... When I need somebody to help me. When I need somebody to pray with me. I know when I cast my care upon the Lord for he cares for me. And I'm going to be careful for nothing. And Father, I'm going to pray this kind of prayer for that situation. And I believe I receive and I give you thanksgiving. Watch. When I'm through, if I can't capture my thoughts. If I can't now set my mind on things that are true. The word is true. God is true. God is just. God is lovely. His word is a good report. If I can't focus on the answer now and harness my thoughts, then I need help. I need help. Most of you, I love you, but you, 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 you cast your care upon the Lord, you pray, and you get right up, and you think negative, and you think it isn't going to work, and you think I've tried this before, and you start thinking on the problem, and before you know it, ten minutes hadn't gone by, and it's in your heart again, killing you. Boy, if I ever lose sleep over anything the next day, if I don't have the victory when I get up that morning, I call a governing elder, or I'll call a ruling elder. Would you pray for me? I'm struggling. I've had things happen to me that I've cast the care. You know, when the church burnt down, that can kind of mess your head up. Can I get a witness? Yeah. You're standing in the parking lot, the church is going up, and the first thing you do is you say, Houston, we have a problem. And I can't tell how many times I've gone to the Lord and said, Lord, you have a problem. I'm not taking this problem. You have a problem. I am not the chief shepherd of this church. Jesus is the chief shepherd. I will accept the title biblically of under shepherd, but technically I'm a sheepdog nipping at your heels trying to get you to follow God. My primary responsibility is a sheepdog just nipping at your heels saying, seek God, follow God, get those CDs. I've taught you how to handle this. Do it. I can't tell me times I've said, Lord... You have a problem, and her name is. <laughs> Lord, you have a problem, and his name is. Lord, you have a problem. This budget is not my problem. I'm a steward of it. It's your problem. I'm not going to wring my hands and lose any sleep. I can preach in the dark. That's what cell phones are for. Open them up. We can see now. I'm not going to worry about the money. I'm not going to worry. It'll kill me. You deserve better. I made a covenant with you 
25 years ago this February that if I can't get up in this pulpit and smile, I'm going to resign. If I can't get up with a pure heart and a happy heart, you deserve someone to love you with a pure heart. You deserve in your family somebody to help you and serve you, not be bitter at you or bitter at God for failing me or my family or anything else in my life. Anything else in my life. Man, I'll pray. I've had some other things worse happen to me than the church burning down. And boy, I couldn't sleep that night. And I'd cast my care upon the Lord. And I would pray a prayer, a kind of prayer that fits that situation. And my mind would not, would not go to sleep. My mind wouldn't quit thinking on it. That's when I call for reinforcements. Don, I need you to pray for me and I don't need you praying junk for me. I need you to pray that I captivate my thoughts and that I keep my mind on the Lord. Isaiah 26, 3 says, Great peace have all they whose mind is stayed upon thee because thou trusteth in him. We say we trust God, but then we don't control our thoughts. We say we, we trust God, but we don't harness and take captive every thought and bring it into obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't be the only one that's prayed for my kids. Cast the care of it on God. Thanked him for them with everything within me. And then ten minutes later, did that child come from my loins? That's not a happy thought. Have you ever had a thought of aliens have kidnapped my kid? That's not a happy thought. That's not a godly thought. Am I making any sense? I'm going to teach you all these different kinds of prayer. We're going to look at the principles that govern them. And we're going to learn, not so we can be legalistic about it, but so we from the heart can pray right. But no matter what I teach you, you're going to have to learn to cast your care upon the Lord, then pray, and listen, then think. Get your mind right. Get your attitude right. That I walk by faith and not by sight. God is working on my behalf. Angels are working on my behalf. The word of God is true. It is forever settled in heaven and earth. I put that in my heart. I I set my mind on things above, not on things below. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Father, I don't thank you for that problem. But I thank you in it that you are with us. Never to leave or forsake us. And greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We always try triumph in Christ Jesus the Lord. The answer is on its way. I believe I receive. I keep my mind on you. That's how you pray. That's how you pray. You don't just throw up a, 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 a prayer and then sit around and meditate all day long on the problem and how it just doesn't seem to work for you like it works for other people. See, when you start thanking God and when you start thinking on God, now your focus is right. Now your heart is set right for the answer to come, for God to flow through you, for God to start to move on your behalf. Boy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be careful for nothing. But in everything, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to pray with thanksgiving. And then finally, brethren, I'm going to think on things that are true, that are pure, that are just, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Amen? Were you blessed? Amen. Let's stand. I want to pray for you. For additional free CDs and a catalog of all of our teaching CDs, please contact Dwayne Sheriff Ministries, Post Office Box 427, Durant, Oklahoma, 74702. And may the grace and peace of God the Father be yours today.